All right. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, first and foremost, I want to thank you for taking a little bit of time out of your day today to join us to learn all about Florida's fantastic sea turtles. This is uh, one of a series of online lectures that we've been producing for the last couple of weeks. If you've missed any of our previous lectures, I encourage you to visit our website at floridaocean.org. We have a, an educational resources page where you can actually download and watch our previous two live online webinars. One of them was focused on the science behind oyster reef restoration, and the other was the story of Florida's algae blooms and water issues. So these are great resources. If you missed our previous lectures, I would encourage you to swing by floridaocean.org to check them out. While you're there, uh, I'd like you to sign up for our email newsletter. It's a great way to find out about upcoming events, including future webinars and, and other uh, educational activities that we have available. On that educational resource page, in addition to a number of different lectures and video clips, we have some online educational packets and lesson plans. If you have any youngsters who are learning from home, you might find some of those uh, valuable and useful. So again, thank you for joining us this afternoon. I'm really excited to take a chance to teach you a little bit about Florida sea turtles. And today is a special day. It is Endangered Species Day. So that's why we're talking about sea turtles today specifically. Before we get started, I have just a little bit of housekeeping to conduct. You are all muted. That way you all can hear me pretty clearly. And we're gonna leave you muted throughout the entire presentation. You should be seeing my PowerPoint taking up most of your screen to the left and my face up to the right. If for some reason you're not seeing that, you can go up to view options at the top of your screen and uh, you're gonna select side by side view and that'll give you a split screen. Once you're in split screen mode, you can actually slide and drag to um, increase or decrease the size of those two viewing panels. Now there's two different ways you can interact with me today. I'm gonna have some questions for all of you. If you'd like to answer one of my questions, go ahead and use the chat box. I've got it pulled up on my screen, so I'll be able to see you answering my questions in real time. At the end of the program, we'll have an opportunity for you to ask me questions. Go ahead and use the Q&A box if you have any questions for me specifically. Can everybody hear me and see me okay? Give me, uh, give me a little comment in the chat window to let me know whether you can see me all right. Fantastic, all right, let's go ahead and get started. Now, before we talk sea turtles, I wanna give you a little bit of background about why Florida Oceanographic Society spends so much time talking about sea turtles. We are a 501c3 nonprofit nature center and research facility located in Stewart, Florida. Our mission is to inspire environmental stewardship of Florida's coastal ecosystems through education, research, and advocacy. So what we're doing today is, is kind of a mishmash of, of all three, but specifically this is our educational component of the work that we do. We do lots of education um, on a daily basis at the Florida Oceanographic Coastal Center, which is a 57 acre public nature center and research facility on Hutchinson Island. So we are closed right now due to COVID-19, but if you haven't visited us in person, I'd love to have you come out and check us out and, uh, and, and spend some time on our property once things start to get back a little bit uh, to, to more of a normal setting. When you visit us, you get to meet and feed our stingrays you'll get to check out the inhabitants of our 750,000 gallon outdoor game fish lagoon aquarium. You'll get to see a number of different aquariums, including an invertebrate touch tank, and you'll get to check out our gorgeous mile long nature trail, which will show you what our barrier islands used to look like before we went and built houses and condos everywhere. Now, there's somebody else I'm leaving out of this story. Our nature center is a forever home for four permanently disabled or non-releasable sea turtles. These are sea turtles that got injured out in the wild and were not able to return to the ocean. Now we're not a sea turtle hospital. We're not a sea turtle rehab facility. We're more like a sea turtle assisted living center. Now Florida does have some fantastic sea turtle hospitals. Uh, some of you may have visited these hospitals. If you've ever been to Loggerhead Marine Life Center, Gumbo Limbo Nature Center, the Florida Keys uh, Sea Turtle Hospital. Go ahead and make a, a comment in the chat box. I'm just curious to see how many of you have actually been to a turtle hospital. These turtle hospitals do a fantastic job of getting sick and injured sea turtles rehabilitated and back out into the ocean. But sometimes they end up with a turtle that can't survive on its own anymore. And that's where we come in. 
because we have this 750,000 gallon outdoor aquarium, we're able to give these turtles a really great forever home. And they're gonna be with us forever. And as forever residents, they've become some of our star conservation ambassadors. Because we have four permanently disabled sea turtles living with us, we're able to use these turtles to teach our community about the threats that turtles are facing out in the wild. And that's a big part of why we do so much sea turtle focused educational programming. All four of our turtles have a disability that causes them to float. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that disability in a second. Now there's another reason we talk about sea turtles quite often. It has something to do with our location. Our coastal center is located about 300 yards from a very important sea turtle nesting beach. And then on the other side of our nature center property is the Indian River Lagoon Estuary. The Indian River Lagoon Estuary is a critical sea turtle nursery area. This is where young sea turtles spend their teenage years. So our physical location is surrounded by sea turtles. So a lot of our educational work focuses on turtles. Now, before we get too far into a sea turtle story, I want to take a big step back and ask all of you a simple question. What kind of animal is a sea turtle? Does anybody know? You know, like what group of animals do they fit into? And I have to tell you, we ask this question twice a day, every day at the Coastal Center, and most people get it wrong. Our number one answer is mammal. Sea turtles aren't mammals. As you guys are saying in the chat box, they are indeed reptiles. Good job. All reptiles have five unique traits that make them a reptile. So I'm gonna go over those quickly. First, all reptiles are vertebrates. Just like you and I, they have a backbone. A sea turtle's backbone runs down the inside of its shell or carapace. The top of a sea turtle shell is known as a carapace. This backbone is actually fused right to the shell. These lines coming off of the backbone are the sea turtle's ribs. Now our ribs have space between them, but a sea turtle's ribs are actually fused together into one big solid bony plate. So this entire carapace works like a suit of armor on the outside of the turtle. It's strong enough to protect them from predators, but unfortunately it's not strong enough to protect them from things like boat collisions. And that's why our four sea turtles live with us at the Coastal Center. All four of our turtles have injuries. Three of the four have injuries that were definitely caused by boat strikes. Those injuries not only affect the outside of the turtle's shell, but they affect the turtle's internal organs and ultimately, that's what leads to those buoyancy problems that I mentioned. All four of our turtles are stuck floating at the top of the water. Can anybody think of some reasons why it's so bad for a sea turtle to be stuck floating at the top of the ocean? It's obviously a big deal or else, you know, these turtles wouldn't be in captivity with us for the rest of their lives. Yeah, good. I'm seeing some great answers coming in. First, they can't dive down to the bottom to get their food. Second, a floating turtle is more vulnerable to predators as well as boat collisions. These turtles also get too hot or too cold. They can get a sunburn. So basically, once a sea turtle starts floating, it needs veterinary care. Sometimes they get better, sometimes they don't. And again, in the case of our four sea turtles, we know they're gonna float for the rest of their lives, so they are gonna be conservation ambassadors for the rest of their lives. The second trait that all reptiles have in common is scaly skin. You can see scales on a sea turtle's head, flippers, tail, but they also have scales on the outside of their shell. Those big plate-like scales on the sea turtle's carapace are called scutes. Scutes are made out of keratin, just like your fingernail, and they provide another hard protective layer on the outside of the turtle. Number three, all reptiles breathe air. So even though sea turtles are a marine animal, they do have to come to the surface and get a breath every once in a while. They're pretty good at holding their breaths. A typical resting breath for an adult turtle can last up to an hour. But get this, the world record, seven hours on one breath of air. That would be like taking a breath right now and not breathing again until dinner time tonight. Now, the reason they're so good at holding their breaths is the surface is a dangerous place for them. They, uh, they're vulnerable at the surface, so they want to spend as much time underwater as possible. Next, the fourth thing that makes a reptile a reptile, they all 
produce eggs. Now I said produce, not lay. There are some reptile species that have live birth, but it's not live birth like we're used to thinking of. They still produce eggs, but the eggs are retained internally until they hatch, and then the babies are born alive shortly thereafter. So still egg production. Most reptiles do actually lay eggs just like birds do. And then finally, the last reptilian trait we're gonna talk about today, they're all cold-blooded. That does not mean that they have cold blood. It just means that they don't have a thermostat. They have to use their environment to warm up or to cool down. So let's think about a land reptile, maybe a snake, one of my favorite reptiles. Where would they go on a cold day to try to warm up quickly? Anybody have any guesses? Yeah, very good. They go out in the sun. They're sunbathers. We call that basking. Sea turtles do bask, but they don't come out of the water to do it. Instead, they float up to the surface. This, unfortunately, is why so many sea turtles get hit by boats. While they're floating at the surface trying to warm up, they are too cold and too slow to get out of the way of a speeding boat. So if any of you are boaters and you see a floating sea turtle, please slow down and go around it. Don't assume that it's going to be able to dive and get out of your way. So those are the five things that make a reptile a reptile. You can see sea turtles fit that pretty well. But how do they compare to other turtles? There are lots and lots of turtles on our planet. Only a few of them are sea turtles. So when we think of other turtles, we normally think about freshwater turtles, things like snapping turtles, painted turtles, sliders. We also think about land turtles or tortoises. On our planet, there are about 45 different species of tortoise. There are about 250 different species of freshwater turtle. Does anybody know how many different types of sea turtle we have living on our entire planet? I'm gonna be impressed if anybody gets this right away. Oh, I see some of my volunteers raising their hands. No fair, you guys know the answers. Very good, we got a bunch of correct answers. Uh, seven is the correct number. So on our whole entire planet, there are only seven different species of sea turtle. One of the reasons that number is so low is because life in the ocean is really challenging for modern day reptiles. In fact, other than sea turtles, there are only three other groups of reptiles that can live in the ocean. We have certain crocodile species that can survive in salt water. There are sea snakes, which are um, a group of marine snakes found in the Pacific Ocean. And then finally, anybody know what the last one is? Crocodiles, sea snakes. I'll give you a hint. They're only found in the Galapagos Islands. Very good, marine iguanas on the Galapagos Islands. So those are the only marine reptiles on Earth today, four different groups. And as a marine reptile, sea turtles have some pretty cool tricks up their sleeve to survive out in the ocean. First, their body is shaped to help them swim. Take a look at this sea turtle's carapace. It is very flat very smooth, very streamlined. Most turtles have a kind of a bicycle helmet shell. Sea turtles have a very aerodynamic shell. They also have very big front flippers. These flippers and this aerodynamic shell, they allow sea turtles to swim effortlessly through the ocean. That's really important because they spend essentially their entire life swimming. There are only two times where you might see a sea turtle on the beach. What are they? Anybody have any guesses? When would you see a sea turtle on dry ground? Outstanding, great, you guys know this. They, generally speaking, only come to the beach to lay their eggs, and then we see them on the beach when the hatchlings emerge and crawl back into the ocean. Now, since I have a big audience today, I, I have to tell you one more time that I don't normally bring up during these presentations. In Hawaii and some surrounding islands and the Galapagos, there's a small group of green sea turtles that do crawl out of the water to bask. 
So they break a rule that I just told you about a minute ago. Some of you may have seen this on vacation in the Hawaiian Islands. The theory is in Hawaii, there historically were no big land predators that would bother a basking turtle. And there are big aquatic predators, primarily tiger sharks. So in certain places, some populations of sea turtles over time have learned to come out of the water to bask. But that's an exception, not a rule. So we've got these turtles that are fantastic swimmers with their flat shells and their big flippers. But that body plan presents a trade-off. Think about most turtles. When they're frightened, they pull back into their shell to hide. Sea turtles can't do that. There's no room. So instead, when they get frightened, they use their speed to get away from predators. With that smooth shell and those big flippers, sea turtles can reach speeds in excess of 20 miles per hour. That's fast. The fastest human swimmer on Earth only goes about six miles per hour. Now, another little trick they have, when they're only a little bit scared, they will turn to face their threat, so their shell is protecting them. If any of you are scuba divers, you may have actually seen that while you're diving. There's another little problem with life out in the ocean. If you and I were stranded on a desert island and had to drink salt water, we would die. Our body can't process salt water, but sea turtles can. Obviously, they live in the ocean. They don't have any choice. They have to drink salty water. So they need a way to get rid of all that salt out of their body. And the way they do, it's kind of funny. They cry. You can see a, a crying sea turtle here. They're not crying because they're sad. They are crying salty tears as a, as a mechanism to pump that salt out of their bloodstream. Inside of every sea turtle's head, there are two big salt glands. These are a lot like tear glands in our eyes, except they're way bigger. In an adult sea turtle, they're as big as my fists. So if I have two big fist-sized salt glands in my head, what do I not have much room left for? Any guesses? It should be pretty obvious. Yeah, a brain. Sea turtles don't have very big brains. Everybody give me a big thumbs up. An adult sea turtle's brain is about as big as an adult thumb. You can actually see those salt glands in this CAT scan. All of this and all of this, salt glands. Their brain is actually located in a pretty small area um, in the center of their skull. Even though sea turtles have a small brain, they have incredible instincts. Uh, instincts are just knowledge that an animal has from the day it's born that guide them through their life. We're gonna talk more about instincts in a minute when we discuss the sea turtle's life cycle, but I want you to realize the reason that sea turtles have such great instincts is they've been on Earth for an incredibly long time. They've actually been around for about 100 million years, which means they've been here since the time of the dinosaurs. Now, I have one other thing I wanna show you. It's not really an adaptation, but it is a unique trait. Take a look down here. The only visible external difference between a male sea turtle and a female sea turtle is the length of their tail. Male sea turtles have an enormous tail. Female sea turtles have a little short stubby tail. So if you're scuba diving, you should be able to pretty easily tell the gender of a sea turtle that swims past you as long as it's an adult. Those traits don't start to appear until uh, turtles reach maturity. Sea turtles truly are global organisms. They're found all the way around our entire planet. They are warm loving species, kind of like me. So they're found mostly in the tropics and subtropics. But take a look here. What's going on with this? And what's going on with this? I'll tell you more about that in a second. Uh, but for the most part, turtles are found in the tropics and the subtropics all the way around our planet. Florida is an incredibly important place for sea turtles. In fact, our coastline is responsible for 90% of North America's recorded sea turtle nests each year. Most of that nesting occurs in a five county area that is really centered on the Treasure Coast from Palm Beach, Palm Beach and Broward counties north to Brevard County. That's where most of our sea turtle nesting occurs. Sea turtles are rare. But luckily, they're pretty well protected. There are laws 
in the United States, and there are laws globally that help protect sea turtle populations. And in honor of Endangered Species Day, I wanted to take a little bit of time to teach you about some of those laws. I would say that most people use phrases like endangered or threatened without really understanding what those words mean. So first, I'm gonna start with the original law designed to protect endangered and threatened animals in the United States, the Endangered Species Act, which was signed into legislation in 1973. And that's why we're celebrating Endangered Species Day today. So again, this is a US law, not a global law. It's administered by the US Fish and Wildlife Service and the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration. Fish and wildlife primarily uh, deals with terrestrial and freshwater aquatic organisms. NOAA deals with marine organisms. Even though this is a US law, it does apply to organisms that are found around the globe. So if somebody tries to import a foreign animal that's listed on the US endangered species list, there are legal ramifications in the United States. This law does not extend to other countries, however. There are two different levels or tiers to the Endangered Species Act, threatened and endangered. And they have two very different meanings. An endangered species is an organism that is in danger of extinction throughout all or at least some major part of its range. So endangered is really bad. Threatened is still pretty bad. It's still part of the Endangered Species Act, but it's not quite so severe. A threatened species is a species that's likely to become endangered within the foreseeable future. So this is a US federal law designed to protect rare organisms at the federal level. There are also state laws designed to protect rare organisms. Each state in the United States maintains a listing of threatened and endangered species. These do not always overlap with the Federal Endangered Species Act. So there are cases of animals that are rare in one state that may actually be endangered at the state level, but are not on the federal endangered list. A, a good example, there are lots of um, rare orchids in Florida. All but one of our rare orchids in our state is either listed as threatened or endangered. However, for most of them, they're not on the federal endangered species list. And that applies to lots of different organisms that are rare in certain geographical areas, but maybe not rare throughout a broader area. In Florida, the US, uh, I'm sorry, the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission is largely tasked with enforcing laws related to the animals and plants themselves. And then the, uh, the DEP, the Florida Department of Environmental Protection, they are tasked with protecting the ecosystems that these organisms rely on and, and plants as well. There are also laws in different states designed to protect specific types of rare animals. Uh, as an example, Florida has a law called the Marine Turtle Protection Act. This is a specific set of rules and regulations at the state level that were written to protect sea turtles. Now let's look at some global uh, conservation tools or laws or, or regulations. First, I want to introduce you to CITES, C-I-T-E-S. It's an acronym, an acronym for the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species of Wild Fauna and Flora. Uh, CITES originated in 1973. Uh, it was finalized and, and signed into place two years later in 1975. Over the years, additional uh, nations have signed on. So currently, this is an international agreement with 183 member parties. CITES is all about regulating the trade of rare or at-risk species. So CITES is not about necessarily protecting the animals from being harvested. The wording of CITES is designed to protect animals from being bought or sold or traded across international borders. So as of this moment, 37,000 different species of, of plants and animals are listed on CITES. And they're broken down into three different appendices depending on how rare those animals are. So CITES is an international agreement and it works pretty well to stem the trade of rare or endangered organisms. Then we have the ICUN Red List. That's the International Union for Conservation of Nature's Red List 
of threatened species. Basically, this is an international ranking system that examines the conservation status of different organisms and distributes those organisms into nine unique categories. So the ICUN red list has animals that have not yet been evaluated but are scheduled to be evaluated. They have animals that are data deficient, things that we don't know enough about yet to determine just how threatened they are. Organisms of least concern, organisms that are near threatened. And then these next three categories are considered threatened under this red list, vulnerable, endangered, and critically endangered. Sadly, there are also some organisms that have gone completely extinct in the wild, and they only exist in captivity. Finally, there are organisms that are extinct. Now this gets a little bit confusing because there are some organisms that, depending on geographic location, fit into different categories on the ICUN red list. Let's take sea turtles, for example. The leatherback sea turtle globally is considered vulnerable. But if you look at certain subpopulations, like the Pacific, uh, East Pacific Ocean subpopulation, they are critically endangered. Other subpopulations are data deficient. Some are only endangered. I use that word lightly. When we look at other species, though, they, they only have a single uh, listing. So hawksbills, for example, are globally critically endangered. Olive ridleys are globally vulnerable to extinction. We see this with lots of different organisms. A, a good example I see a lot, bluefin tuna. Bluefin tuna are listed as endangered on the ICUN red list, but they're not endangered under the US Endangered Species Act, which is why you can still buy bluefin tuna at certain restaurants. So hopefully things like the ICUN red list will eventually help governments make management decisions that move towards stricter conservation regulations on animals that are at threat or at risk of going extinct. All right, let's move on to talk about sea turtles and sea turtle nesting here in Florida. I'll remind you that on Earth, there are seven different species of sea turtle. Five of them live in Florida's waters. Three of those five nest here on our beaches, the leatherback, the loggerhead, and the greenie. Our sea turtle nesting season officially starts on March 1st and runs through October 31st, although sea turtles don't have a calendar. So sometimes we see early arrivals and sometimes we see later nesting, but that's a good generality. I, I speak in, in generalities quite a bit because these turtles and all animals in general don't necessarily follow exact rules. Scientists don't always agree on exact measurements. So I'm gonna give lots of averages, but understand that we're kind of trying our best to give the, um, the, the, the roundabout answer to a lot of questions that don't necessarily have very specific answers. And uh, in Florida, most of our nesting occurs after dark. And I'll talk more about that in a second. There's a very good reason for that. It doesn't, it doesn't occur that way in other places. There are areas where we see daytime nesting. So let's dig into our uh, Florida sea turtle species, starting with my absolute favorite, the leatherback sea turtle. This is Florida's rarest nesting sea turtle. It's also the largest sea turtle on Earth. In fact, it's one of the largest reptiles on our entire planet. There are only a few crocodile species that get heavier than an adult leatherback. They average five to seven feet in length, 800 to 1500 pounds. They can actually get quite a bit bigger than that. They get that big eating nothing but jellyfish. Jellyfish are 98% water, they're not very nutritious. So leatherbacks have to eat a lot. They've been documented eating occasionally as much as their body weight in a single day. Think about that at dinner tonight. It's a lot of food. Where do they find all those jellyfish? Well, they are deep divers. They actually have been documented diving as deep as 6,000 feet underwater looking for layers packed full of jellyfish. There's a lot of water pressure 6,000 feet under the ocean surface. If a sea turtle with a hard bony shell dove a mile underwater, the pressure would crush it. Leatherbacks don't have a hard shell. Their rib cage is more like our rib cage. It's a little bit flexible. They have uh, little bony plates embedded into their thick leathery skin, but their, their, their bones aren't necessarily fused together. And that allows them to smush on the way down and then unsmush 
on the way back up. That's only one of their cool adaptations. Take a look over here. This is the throat of a leatherback sea turtle. And what you're looking at are hundreds of sharp, thorn-like papillae that face inward. Those papillae help leatherback sea turtles swallow slippery jellyfish without those jellyfish slipping back out of the turtle's mouth. Pretty cool adaptation. They've been eating jellyfish for a really long time, so they're pretty much immune to the sting of jellies. And I have to tell you, leatherbacks are jellyfish experts, but most sea turtles will eat jellyfish to one degree or another. If you look on a leatherback's jawline, you'll see they have these sharp cusps. We think they help the leatherback grab onto and bite through slippery jellyfish. And they have one more really cool adaptation. It's pretty cold 6,000 feet underwater. Leatherbacks are actually able to keep their body warmer than their surroundings. They're one of the only reptiles on Earth that can do this. And they have three mechanisms that allow them to stay warmer than their surroundings. First, one of my favorite scientific words, they use gigantothermy. I wish I could put an echo on that. Basically, that just means that they're really big and that lets them stay warm for a longer period of time. If I gave you a big pot of soup and a little cup of soup, the pot would stay warmer longer than the cup. Same thing with the big leatherback. They also have more body fat than most sea turtles. And then finally, they have a built-in heat exchange system in their flippers. It works just like your home air conditioning system. In their flippers, they have arteries going out and veins going back in. In a leatherback turtle, the arteries and veins are touching. So warm blood is going out, but cold blood is getting reheated by the artery before it enters back into the body. And that's how they are able to stay warmer than their surroundings. Because I love leatherbacks, I'm going to talk about them more. I actually have a neat video to show you. I want to apologize. Zoom does not stream videos very well, so it's going to be a little bit choppy, but I think you'll appreciate this. Uh, I've been fortunate enough to see a number of leatherback sea turtles in my career, but I've only seen one nesting during the daytime. And that's what I want to show you here. This was in Jensen Beach a few years ago. And I show you this to demonstrate the enormous size of these turtles. I also want to show you how they crawl. Leatherbacks crawl like they're doing the breaststroke, both flippers at the same time. And they leave a trail in the sand that looks like train tracks or tank treads. You can see people watching. I have to tell you, everybody was very cordial and very polite. They stayed back. They, especially during the sensitive nesting phase, they gave this mother lots and lots of room. They stayed back like 100 feet. And uh, even as she crawled in the water, people were very respectful and everybody did the right thing. It was an incredible opportunity to see this living giant crawling down to the water's edge. They look like, like a little toy car, like not a toy car, like a, like a kid's battery operated car driving down the beach. They're absolutely enormous. Now, one of the cool things that's going on in our part of Florida is research on leatherback sea turtles led by a nonprofit called Florida Leatherbacks Incorporated. Every single night, while you're in bed, scientists from Florida Leatherbacks, they're out there on the beach driving up and down with their night vision, looking for nesting leatherback turtles. When they find a sea turtle, they're able to put a flipper tag on its, on its flipper. It's kind of like a, an earring, it's an external tag, but those fall off over time. So they're also able to attach little microchips into the musculature of the turtle. These are just like the microchips you'd put uh, in your dog. They're, they're called pit tags. Every once in a while, they have the funding available to put a satellite tag on a leatherback turtle. That's what you see here in, in blue on the, the right side panel. What they're finding with these satellite tags is absolutely incredible. First, it should be no surprise that leatherback turtles that nest in Florida make huge migrations between nesting seasons, sometimes going as far north as the Canadian Maritimes. Remember I showed you the map earlier, there were some northern migrating sea turtles. Those are all leatherbacks because they can stay warmer than their surroundings. Even more impressive, leatherback sea turtles nest on average every 10 or 11 days during nesting season. Some of these tagged turtles are making incredible journeys just in that 10 day period. Uh, looking at some of the maps that Florida Leatherback has posted on their website, these turtles are going three, four, 500 miles sometimes just between nesting bouts. In the last couple of years, just in Martin County, Florida Leatherbacks has identified 1,899 
nesting events where they physically saw the turtle. That represents 475 different individual turtles. Of those turtles, 204 were brand new to their program. They had no tags in them. Some of the other turtles have been tagged years earlier during research that started in 2001 in Palm Beach County. So we have these turtles visiting our beaches year after year after year. And one of the neat stories, these researchers sometimes have turtles that they know very well for a number of years. The turtles will disappear for a while. And then out of the blue, one of these tag leatherbacks suddenly reappears on our shoreline. So it's really cool research that happens while we're comfortably tucked into bed. Uh, check out the Florida Leatherbacks website for more information. They, they're doing really cool work locally. All right, moving on from leatherbacks, our next sea turtle that nests in our part of Florida is the loggerhead. If you've been to Florida Oceanographic Society, you've probably met Lily, our loggerhead turtle. He's our biggest turtle. He's a full-grown adult male loggerhead. Loggerheads are named after their big brown head that looks like a big brown log, hence loggerhead. In that head, there's a very powerful set of jaws that are used to crush their favorite food, things like lobsters, crabs, and snails. Believe it or not, loggerheads are the smallest of our local nesting turtles, 250 to 300 pounds, three feet or so on average. So they're pretty big, even though they're our smallest. The east coast of Florida is the most important loggerhead nesting area on earth. It's so cool that we have this right in our backyard. Uh, areas like Palm Beach County and the Archie Carr National Wildlife Refuge up in Brevard County have the highest densities of nesting loggerheads on earth. This is literally right here on the coastline of East Central Florida. Next, we have our final local nesting turtle, the green sea turtle. If you've been to Florida Oceanographic Society, you have met Annabelle, Hank, and Turt. They are our three green turtles. Green turtles are the largest of the hard shell turtles on earth, reaching 350 to 400 pounds when they're full grown three, three and a half, sometimes even four feet in length. So they're good-sized turtles. But even though they're huge, they have pretty small heads. It almost looks like a shrunken head when you see it in person. If any of you remember the movie Beetlejuice, that's what they look like. They don't need a big, powerful head with big, powerful jaws because their preferred diet, especially as adults, is seagrass and algae. They're largely herbivorous. And that green diet is what gives them their name. You can see in these photos, they're not green, they're brown or gray. However, their green diet tints their body fat a greenish color. They're actually green on the inside. Because green sea turtles eat seagrass, they rely on healthy seagrass beds, particularly as juveniles. These are some of the turtles that we find using the Indian River Lagoon Estuary when they're young. The Indian River Lagoon Estuary has lost most of its seagrass. So you see the problem. In areas where seagrasses are dying off, these turtles are not necessarily able to get the food resources that they need. So that's a, a pretty big problem. Overall though, Florida's green sea turtles, especially our nesting adult population, they're doing a lot better than they, they used to be. And I'll show you a graph in a minute that illustrates that. Because they're doing better, just a few years ago, they were downlisted from endangered to threatened on the endangered species list. So it's a positive thing. Those are our three local nesting turtles, but we have two other species that we sometimes see in our waters, but not necessarily on our beaches, the hawksbill and the Kemp's Ridley. Hawksbills are actually really common, especially in South Florida. If any of you are scuba divers, I would bet that you've probably seen hawksbills out on the reef. They nest primarily in the Caribbean, but they hang out off of our shorelines as, uh, as adults between nesting periods. They have a unique diet. They eat something that is pretty unpalatable. In fact, something that's oftentimes toxic. They eat sponges. And you can see in this image, their parrot-like or hawk-like beak is used to scrape sponges right off of the reef. Hawksbill sea turtles are critically endangered because they have been harvested just for their pretty shell. And I'll, I'll tell you more about that towards the end of our, our lecture today. Kemp's Ridley sea turtles occasionally show up off the coast of Florida. They are the smallest and the rarest sea turtle on our entire planet. They nest primarily uh, on a very limited number of beaches in Mexico, in the Gulf of Mexico specifically on, on our side of Mexico. 
as well as uh, into Texas. They're a species that nests quite often during daylight hours in huge numbers. And we call those, those aggregations of nesting turtles arrivadas. By nesting all at once, these turtles take advantage of the concept of safety in numbers. They are less likely to be eaten because there's lots of them on the beach. Their eggs are less likely to be eaten by um, nest raiding predators. You know, those predators get full eventually. And then all the eggs hatch around the same time. So the little babies are less likely to be eaten. Again, safety in numbers. There are two more species of sea turtle that we don't see in Florida very often. First, we have the olive ridley. They're the most abundant sea turtle on earth, but they're primarily found in the tropics. So it's pretty unusual to see one uh, off the coast of Florida. They also nest in Atabatas, primarily on the Pacific side of Central America. These turtles nest in enormous, enormous concentrations. You may have seen videos of, of Arabatas like this on you know, National Geographic documentaries. It's pretty amazing. And then we have the flatback sea turtle. They are only found around Australia. They're non-migratory, and we don't know very much about them. In fact, the ICUN Red List uh, has them listed as a data deficient species. We really don't know very much about them. All right, I want to switch gears now and move on to my favorite part of today's lecture. I want to tell you about the life of a sea turtle and how they use their instincts to get through life. And their life is quite a long life. They actually can live for up to 80 years. Really impressive. And uh, you know, their, their instincts drive them through a series of behaviors that essentially you know, connects the, the egg cycle all the way back to the egg laying, you know, the old, the old what comes first, the chicken or the egg. So I'm gonna start with the nesting process. This is really important for us at Florida Oceanographic Society because of our location. Again, right across the street from our coastal center is an important sea turtle nesting beach. Our nesting season, again, runs from March through October. And during those months, on any given night, there's a good chance that there's a sea turtle somewhere locally on the beach laying her eggs. I said night on purpose. These sea turtles are built to be great swimmers, but they're terrible at crawling up the beach. They're just not built for it. So nesting is pretty stressful. It takes a lot of energy. It's kind of scary for a mother turtle. They would rather nest at night when it's not so hot and there aren't as many predators. When a mother sea turtle reaches maturity and is old enough to make her first nest, she does something amazing. It takes a sea turtle between 25 and 35 years to become an adult. Parents, how do you feel about a 35-year childhood? So during that extended uh, juvenile and subadult phase, these turtles do not visit the beach they were born at, but they never forget where they came from. When they're ready to make their first nest, they use Earth's magnetic field like an invisible roadmap. And they're actually able to navigate using that magnetic field thousands and thousands of miles sometimes back to the same general area that they were born in. Why do you think a mother sea turtle would swim so far to nest? Why doesn't she just try to find the closest beach possible? What do you think? Why spend all that energy migrating when there might be a beach closer by? What does she know about that area that she doesn't know about anywhere else on Earth? Yeah, she knows it's a safe beach because she survived after being born on that beach. Her instincts are going to drive her back to that beach because it worked for her. How do we know that they use the magnetic field to navigate? Well, this is pretty cool. I have a colleague who studies uh, navigation in spiny lobsters. And what she does is she puts little blindfolds on a lobster and then puts them on an acrylic panel that's very slippery. So it's like a lobster treadmill. She then rolls that into a giant electromagnet. And by switching around the magnetic field, she's able to steer the movements of that lobster. Researchers have done pretty much the same thing with sea turtles. And that's how we know that they have magnetic little particles in their brain that help them not only tell north, south, east, and west, but they can detect the angle and the intensity of our magnetic field lines. Pretty cool story. So once a mama 
is ready to actually lay her eggs. She comes back to that beach she was born on. She starts a process that can last, I'd say on average an hour, maybe an hour and a half, sometimes quicker, sometimes longer. I'm gonna give you the short version of that because I know you don't wanna hear me drone on for that long. The, the process begins as the mother turtle crawls out of the water. Very often, she's gonna stop and take a long look around. She is looking for predators. If she sees anything that looks like a predator, her instincts tell her to abandon her efforts, turn around, and crawl back into the water. If she is scared multiple times in the same evening, or if she's scared really bad, she sometimes will dump her eggs in the ocean and they will not hatch. Why am I telling you this sad fact? Well, if you're out on the beach at night during turtle season, whether you're fishing, or stargazing or taking a walk, and a mother sea turtle sees you, there's a very good chance that she might abandon her nest. Folks, this happens all the time. Most people don't even realize they've done it. Our request to you, please do not use our beaches at night during turtle season. I know it's tempting to go out there and enjoy our, our beautiful shorelines after dark. It's just not worth it. You risk causing harm to the mother turtle. You also risk breaking the law. Remember I said sea turtles are protected by the law? Well, it is illegal to disturb them or bother them or harass them or approach them or change their behavior. So even if it's an accident, we don't wanna do that. The best thing to do is to stay off the beaches at night. Once our mamas are happy that there are no predators around, they continue their journey up the beach. Now I have a really cool video to show you that I'm gonna narrate. Most of our nesting happens at night. This is a video of an Olive Ridley nesting during daytime hours so you could see the process. So first, mama drags her enormous body awkwardly up the beach. When she finds a spot she likes, she uses all four of her flippers to clear away the dry sand around her body. She creates a body pit. This is a shallow depression that lets her sink down a little bit so she's less visible to predators. Then she uses her back flippers one at a time to scoop a deep hole in the sand. This is her egg chamber. And it, this goes on and on. She'll scoop and fling and scoop and fling and scoop and fling until she has a deep enough hole to accommodate her eggs. Next, she'll lay somewhere between 75 and 100 eggs, maybe more, maybe less, depending on species, into that, into that nest. The eggs have a thick rubbery shell. So you'll see when they hit the bottom, they bounce, they don't break. Uh, leatherback eggs are about as big as a billiard ball. Loggerhead and green sea turtle eggs are about as big as a ping pong ball. When she's done laying, she uses her back flippers to refill the egg chamber with sand. Just like digging the hole, she goes one flipper at a time, scoop after scoop, until the egg chamber is completely filled. Then she uses her body weight to pack that sand back down. She almost dances on top of the egg chamber to make sure that the sand is firmly compacted so predators can't dig the nest up. Then she switches gears and using her enormous front flippers, she starts throwing sand vigorously back over the nest. She actually crawls forward as she's doing this, making another depression in the sand, but burying her nest behind her. When she's done, she turns around and heads right back into the ocean. Mother sea turtles don't guard their nest. They don't incubate their eggs. In fact, for the rest of those, those, the life of those baby turtles, they are on their own. They will never meet their mother or their father. Don't worry. They're pre-programmed with all the instincts they need to get them through their life. Now that's it for, for mama on the beach for, for this particular nesting period. But she'll be back usually a week or, or two, day, uh, two weeks later, she'll come back to the beach to make another nest. Sea turtles typically nest several times during a nesting season. Here in Florida, the average number of nests per mama turtle is around four or five nests per, per turtle. Uh, a few years ago though, there was a leatherback sea turtle with a satellite tracking tag on her back who made 11 nests in one summer on Florida beaches. Nesting is a lot of work for these turtles. They spend you know, several months in um, nesting mode. We don't think they eat very much during nesting season. 
the physical process of nesting is very demanding. So when they're done for the year, they typically take the next year off. They go on a little vacation, they go to foraging areas, and they fatten back up. So rather than nesting every single summer, most mother sea turtles nest every other year. All right, let's go back to our nest. Now we have 75 or 100 little rubbery eggs buried in the sand. It takes them on average about two months to hatch. During that time, something incredible happens. Unlike human beings, where our gender is mostly determined by our genetics, there is no genetic difference between boy sea turtles and girl sea turtles. They don't use the XY chromosome system. Instead, the temperature of the nest determines their gender. Temperatures just a few degrees below average produce mostly males. Temperatures just a few degrees above average produce mostly females. And while we do occasionally get a mix, quite often that process works more like a light switch where you get one or the other. And there's a very specific point during the development of the baby turtle where that gender gets permanently locked into place. This has some big implications when we think about climate change. Folks, I totally understand that climate change is a challenging topic to talk about. But as a scientist, I'd like to tell you that climate change is a real thing. It is happening right now in our lifetimes, and it is triggered by human activities. The reason it's so difficult to see is we're not talking about giant temperature changes very small changes are already having very big impacts on many organisms, sea turtles included. There is a scientist here in Florida, Dr. Jeanette Weinekin, you see her in the middle photo here, from Florida Atlantic University, who studies exactly this. And in the last, I believe in the last five years of her research, she has only found male sea turtles during one nesting season the vast majority of the babies she's examining, and in most years, 100% of the babies she's examining are females. And she's not alone in these findings. Scientists from Australia are seeing similar patterns on some of their study beaches. So this is an example of climate change affecting organisms right now, not you know maybe 100 years down the road. Think about that for a second. All right, let's go back to our, uh, our nest. After about two months, our babies emerge. And uh, just like mama, they'd rather be on the beach at night. It's a little cooler. There aren't as many predators up to worry about. And uh, they generally emerge all at once. So check out this video I took in Hope Sound. This is an enormous leatherback nest that emerged. And you could see all those babies popped out at the same time and made quite a set of tracks crawling down the beach. If you are ever lucky enough to see a baby sea turtle crawling down to the water's edge like this, I don't want you to do anything about it. Don't help the turtle. Don't pick it up and carry it down to the water. Don't pick it up for a photo. Don't put it in a bucket. Don't put it in your child's sandcastle. All of these things happen. Just let the turtle do its thing. Nature will guide that turtle down to the water's edge. Uh, they're very fragile and very sensitive during this phase. Plus, if you touch them or move them, they can get disoriented. If you ever see a sea turtle that's in distress, whether it's a hatchling or an adult, I'd like you to pick up the phone and call um, Florida Game and Freshwater Fish Commission. Boy, I just dated myself. That's their old name. Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. And uh, they're going to give you instructions on what you should do to help assist with that, with that turtle. And uh, you can actually be you know, helpful at rescuing turtles, but you have to use the guidance of FWC. So back to our life cycle. Once these little turtles hit the ocean, they go on quite the journey. First, they spend the, the initial 48 hours of their life swimming nonstop. They have enough energy in their old yolk sac inside of their belly to swim for about two days straight. We call this the frenzy. They're trying to get as far offshore as possible to get away from predators that live in the shallows. They are looking for big floating mats of sargassum seaweed, the same weed lines that fishermen look for when they're offshore fishing. Once they get into those weed lines, they, they historically kind of disappeared to science. We didn't know where they went for the next few years of their life. We call that period the lost years. 
thankfully, researchers have been working hard to unravel the lost years. This is Dr. Kate Mansfield from UCF. Uh, she and some of her colleagues, including Dr. Jeanette Weineken, who we mentioned already, developed a very small satellite tracking tag that they were able to place on young sea turtles. And what they found is that these little turtles sometimes go on very big journeys. Some young sea turtles will actually migrate part passively, drifting through ocean currents, part actively swimming all the way around the North Atlantic, sometimes traveling thousands and thousands of miles when they're little. As they get a little bit older, maybe the size of a dinner plate, they um, make a journey back to shallower coastal waters, areas that we call nursery habitats. These nursery habitats are where sea turtles spend their teenage years. In Florida, we have two main nursery habitats. We have coral reefs off our beaches, and we have seagrass beds in our estuaries, like the Indian River Lagoon. Those two habitats aren't doing very well. Human activities, including pollution, are devastating our reefs and our seagrass beds. Most of Florida's coral reefs have um, been severely degraded over the last 30 or 40 years. Even in just the last six or seven years, we have a brand new coral disease wiping out corals throughout our state. There's some thought that that disease is linked to, to water quality issues. Right here in the Indian River Lagoon, we've lost more than 50,000 acres of our seagrass in the last decade or so. Globally, I would argue that habitat loss is the biggest threat facing sea turtles. Uh, we're gonna wrap up our program in just a few more minutes. And at the end, I'll talk about some of the other threats that sea turtles are facing. But I really wanna emphasize the loss of habitats, both nursery habitats like seagrass beds and reefs, as well as nesting habitats and foraging habitats. That's really one of the biggest threats that these turtles are facing. All right, so if I told you you're not allowed to go out on the beach at night to look for sea turtles, how do you get to witness this incredible act? Well, there are organizations in Florida that have very special permits from FWC to conduct educational sea turtle walks during June and July. Florida Oceanographic Society has one of these permits. So in a normal year, we're actually able to take you out to safely witness a loggerhead sea turtle laying her eggs. I, I say in a normal year, at the present time, because of COVID-19, we have not yet made a decision about our sea turtle walks. I still have my fingers crossed that we will be able to do some turtle walks this summer. Uh, please check back on our website or our social media pages for more info about turtle walks. If you subscribe to our e-newsletter, we will definitely let you know um, where our sea turtle walk plans are going. The idea behind these walks is they create a safe environment for people to witness sea turtle nesting without jeopardizing the safety of the turtle. We are trained by the state. We use night vision and we use very special techniques to make sure that we don't inadvertently scare a mother back in the water. Remember, scaring a mother back into the water can cause some, some pretty negative side effects. This is my time to get up on a soapbox. Please don't go out on the beach at night trying to find sea turtles on your own. This is a, a traditional thing here in the Treasure Coast and the Space Coast. I grew up doing it. We didn't know any better. We didn't realize how harmful our presence on the beach at night can be to a nesting turtle. Just being out there is enough to really disturb these turtles. It's also against the law to try to do like an organized sea turtle walk or guide people out to see these turtles. It's very illegal to touch or bother a sea turtle or touch their eggs. So please try to do it the right way. Go on an organized walk. I even wanna point out that we've got a red flashlight turned on here. Folks, red flashlights can still disturb sea turtles. I see some um, businesses selling red lights as turtle safe. They're actually, they're kind of misusing uh, regulations regarding lighting. Red street lights and red building lights are better than normal lights. Red flashlights are still a no-no. I don't wanna see anybody out there walking down the beach with a red flashlight. Those lights are less visible to turtles, but they are not invisible. Even under our research permit, our turtle walk permit, we're only allowed to turn our red light on briefly at very specific times during the process. If you have to be on the beach, let's say you're an angler, please use a red light, but keep it off as much as you can. Um, we, uh, I, wanna, I wanna quickly tell you a little bit about local nesting numbers. We've got a lot of sea turtles nesting on South Hutchinson Island. In fact, 
last year, the beach right across from FOS, and I say right across from FOS, it's part of a, about an 18 mile barrier island, had 10,800 nests. How do we know that number? Well, in our part of Florida, two different private businesses, Ecological Associates and In-Water Research Group are out every morning counting every single sea turtle nest they find. They also count all the abandoned nests I mentioned, the false crawls that we talked about earlier. They mark some of those nests with uh, ribbon and, and stakes like you see on the left. They don't mark all of them though. Uh, each year they're instructed by FWC to mark a certain ratio of nests depending on a variety of factors. For example, last year they marked one out of eight loggerhead nests, they marked all leatherback nests, and they marked every other green sea turtle nest. When you're out on the beach, you can actually tell which species made a given nest based on these two letters. The initials on the top of that stake refer to the Latin name of the sea turtle. CC, Coretta Coretta, is a loggerhead. DC, Dermochiles coraceae, is a leatherback. CM, Chelonia mitis is a green sea turtle. Additionally, the date is listed and the, the zone or section of the beach. They don't mark these nests just to keep people away. They mark them so they can come back after the eggs emerge to get a head count. Not only do they count the number of eggs that were laid, they can count how many eggs successfully hatched versus how many failed to hatch, as well as the number of babies that maybe died while trying to dig their way up to the surface. It's important to know how many eggs get laid every year, but it's just as important to know how many of those nests, or uh, eggs rather, were able to hatch and crawl down to the ocean. How do you tell which species was responsible for a given nest? They all leave different track marks in the sand. Loggerhead turtles crawl arm after arm after arm, kind of like the freestyle stroke. They leave little comma-shaped tracks in the sand. Green sea turtles do the breast stroke. So their tracks look like railroad tracks or a ladder. And then leatherbacks, guys, they're seven feet across. It looks like somebody drove a tank up and down the beach. Our local beaches are being surveyed on a daily basis, but so are 215 other beaches around the state of Florida. FWC runs a statewide nesting beach survey program covering 825 miles of our state. Now you'll see there are areas that aren't surveyed, but by surveying the same areas year after year, FWC is able to get kind of a ballpark idea of how many nests are occurring each year and how patterns are changing year after year. And that lets them produce graphs like this. And very quickly, I know, I know we're going just a hair over on time, but I promise we're just about ready to wrap up. Um, I want to quickly show you nesting trends in our state for three different species. First, for loggerheads, we see that they've been relatively steady over the last 30 years. There was a concerning dip in the early 2000s, but those numbers have recovered very nicely. For green sea turtles, based on data from a subset of those beaches that are surveyed every year, we see a couple of cool patterns. First, green turtles exhibit very strong biannual cycles. Every other year, they go from big year to little year. Next, you'll notice that back at the start of this in 1989, there were hardly any green sea turtles in Florida. We saw a unique increase in roughly 2014. 2014, all of a sudden we had a record-breaking year. 2016 broke that record. Um, 20, I'm sorry, I'm off by a little bit here. So I'm looking at uh, 2013, sorry, 2017 broke that record. Uh, and then 2019 broke yet another record. So th this graph, it looks like the dates are a little bit skewed, so I misread it. But basically for the last four years in a row, the last four peaks in a row rather, we've seen a an, an exponential increase in green sea turtle nesting numbers. Even with these huge peaks, we still have low years every other year. And then finally, uh, leatherbacks show a, a phenomenal increase as well. Back in 1989, there were just a handful of leatherback nests in Florida. And in recent years, we've seen a wonderful increase in leatherback nesting numbers. Look at these statewide numbers for 2019. Florida had 106,000 loggerhead nests, 53,000 green turtle nests, and 1,100 leatherback nests just on those 825 miles of surveyed beaches. We have a lot of turtles in Florida. Pretty cool story. All right, the very last thing I want to talk to you about before we wrap up, the things that are hurting sea turtles. 
I talked to you earlier about habitat loss being the biggest threat. There are also some natural threats. Predators, for example. Little hatchlings are vulnerable to lots of predators. Raccoons, birds, crabs, fire ants, even dogs and cats. Folks, please keep your dogs off the beach during turtle season. Even a leashed dog can, in the blink of an eye, pick up and injure a hatchling. Dogs also dig up sea turtle nests, and at night, they interfere with nesting mother turtles. Uh, natural processes like erosion can expose sea turtle nests. It's kind of sad, but once a nest is exposed, those eggs aren't going to hatch. Unlike chicken eggs, which rotate, a mother a chicken will actually rotate the eggs as they incubate, any kind of movement of a reptile egg can kill the developing embryo. When these little hatchlings hit the water, they're still vulnerable to predators, primarily game fish, snook, tarpon, uh, jacks. In my fisheries research, I've done some work looking at the diets of snook, and I've actually found sea turtle hatchlings inside of snook bellies. So they're not free from predators when they hit the ocean. As adults, sea turtles are pretty safe from predators. About the only major threat to adult sea turtles is the shark, particularly tiger sharks. Tiger sharks, instead of triangular teeth, they have curved teeth that work like a circular saw blade. They can cut right through the shell of an adult sea turtle. We also have cold-related issues. As a tropical species, sea turtles are very sensitive to cold snaps. When they get too cold, they float to the surface and become immobilized. If they don't get warmed up quickly enough, they can die from this. You may have seen stories in the news about organizations in New England flying cold stunned sea turtles back to Florida for release. Thankfully, once you warm them back up, they do pretty well. The last thing I wanna to talk to you about today, and I appreciate you guys sticking around a couple minutes long. The last thing I wanna to talk to you about today, threats to sea turtles that relate to you and I. Human impacts are a big issue because we have control over these things. First, we see sea turtles getting disoriented or turned around because of lighting. So we wanna keep our beaches dark at night. If you live in a waterfront home or condo, make sure your community is using turtle safer lighting. That's more of an orange or reddish color light that's less visible to turtles. A big thing that all of you can do, close your curtains at night. Light coming out of your windows is one of the biggest light spills that we see on the beach um, or turn off any outside lighting. If you have to be on the beach at night, remember what I said, don't use any lighting, even the littlest bit of lighting like checking your phone or turning on a flashlight for a second or taking a photo is enough to disorient a mother or her hatchlings. Those babies sometimes end up out in our streets and sidewalks. So just any kind of lighting at all is a, is a real negative impact on turtles. Next, we want to keep our beaches clean. Any kind of garbage is bad for turtles, but things like balloons and plastic bags are especially bad because they look like jellyfish in the water. Folks, pick up after yourselves, pick up after other beachgoers, do the environment a favor, uh, pick up three for the sea. Every time you're at the ocean, pick up three pieces of trash and throw them in the garbage on your way out. Never ever let helium balloons go. I don't care how far inland you live, these balloons go thousands of miles and they end up in our oceans and they get eaten by things like sea turtles, dolphins, and whales. Finally, I want you to keep our beaches flat. Things like beach chairs and sandcastles can scare sea turtles back in the water. They think they're predators, they're not that bright. They can also fall into holes and get trapped and they can get wrapped up and tangled in your beach furniture. Even if you're coming back the very next day, please bring all of your stuff off the beach with you every single day. And that brings us to Florida Oceanographic Society's Dark, Flat, and Clean campaign. You may have seen some of these signs on the beach. This is our way of reminding you that your everyday actions can have an impact on the survival of these threatened and endangered beautiful sea turtles that we share our beaches with. Last but not least, I want to talk about bigger illegal threats that you and I probably don't have much to do with, but they're still a problem globally. Sea turtles are still being killed for their meat, their eggs, and their shells. Um, if you're traveling abroad and you see something for sale that came from a sea turtle, maybe jewelry made out of a hawksbill turtle shell or meat at a restaurant from a, from a sea turtle, you can actually make a difference just by refusing to purchase that item. You don't want to bring any of this stuff back through customs. You will get in big trouble just for possessing any part of a sea turtle. 
Unfortunately, in our area, there, there are still issues with sea turtle poaching on our beaches. Every summer, you hear about this in the news. Thankfully, FWC and our local sheriff's departments do a phenomenal job of busting these egg poachers. They're actually up at night with helicopters using their night vision and their IR scopes to uh, patrol our beaches, and they've done a really good job of trying to keep our turtles safe. With that, I wanna give you all a really big thank you for sticking around for our whole program today and taking the time to learn about sea turtles. Before I take your questions, I wanna remind you that all of our previous live webinars are available at floridaocean.org. Just go to our educational resources tab. You can watch our program about Florida's algae blooms, as well as our presentation about oyster reef restoration. We have other educational resources there for, uh, for children as well as adults. While you're on our website, definitely sign up for our email newsletter. It's a great way to stay in touch with our organization while we're closed to the public. We do hope to reopen eventually, and when we are open, we are so excited to see all of your smiling faces again at the Coastal Center. Stay tuned through social media for any kind of updates about Florida Oceanographic Programming. Finally, if you enjoyed uh, our free webinar today, please take a second to click on the donate button at the top of the FOS website. Even a tiny donation will help us keep moving while our coastal center is closed to the public. You can help support the behind the scenes work in our research and restoration departments, as well as our animal care department that is happening right now while we're closed to the public. With that, I'm gonna go ahead and pull up my Q&A box. If anybody has any questions, go ahead and type them in. And uh, I would imagine that some of the, yep, I'm looking here, some of, the, some of the questions you guys have, it looks like I've been able to answer some of those already. But uh, here's a good one. How many mates does a female sea turtle have? Are all the eggs laid in a single nesting season from the same male? What a great question. Sea turtles use a unique strategy. So first, one mating can create several nests. So a female sea turtle is actually able to store sperm from a single mating and use that to fertilize multiple different batches of eggs. So it's entirely possible that mother turtle that made 11 nests in one season might have mated one time. But on the opposite side of that, a sea turtle can mate multiple times for one single nest. Um, researchers who are doing genetic studies on hatchlings have found that sometimes one nest will have multiple fathers. So they've got a couple of different strategies that they use, and it's a unique way to ensure genetic diversity, but also to ensure that they're taking advantage of any mating opportunity that they have. Oh, here's a really good question. Since eggs are expensive for females to produce and sperm is relatively easy for male turtles to produce, why is it so important that we still have male, or why is it so important that um, we need a kind of an even ratio of male and female sea turtles? This relates to this concept that climate change is pushing sea, sea turtle populations in a male, or I'm sorry, in a female dominated direction. Yes, females are more important than males, and yes, one male is able to mate with multiple females, but there could come a point where males are so scarce in a given population that there might not be enough males to mate with all the available females. Thankfully, males migrate a little bit more than females do. They're not, they're not quite as um, site fidelic as females, meaning they don't necessarily come back to the exact same area each year. So it's possible that while some beaches like parts of Florida and parts of Australia are making mostly female sea turtles right now, the males, which move around a little bit more, they may be moving into those areas and, and fertilizing um, the eggs of females that were maybe hatched on a, on a different beach. So yes, it's concerning that there might not be enough males to successfully fertilize all females in certain areas, but at least at this time, we're hopeful, fingers crossed, that at the larger geographic scale, there will be enough males around. I have seen some research projects right now focusing on, on how best to cool down sea turtle nests. And some of the theories I've seen floated include running sprinklers during nesting season, because it seems like it's not just a temperature thing, it's also a moisture thing. And by keeping the nests a little bit wet, we get a more even ratio of males and females. There are some scientists also looking at installing shade cloth over the nests to shade them out. Now I have to tell you, this is an even bigger issue for alligators and crocodiles because they use the opposite system. 
higher temperatures create more male alligators and crocodiles. More males means less egg production. So it's a big threat for crocodilians. Uh, somebody has a question about summer camps. Um, I, I know that's an off topic, but I will mention it. At this time, Florida Oceanographic Society has decided to cancel our June summer camps, but we are still optimistic that we will be able to run camps in July. Most of our sessions are full, but we do still have spaces available. If you're interested in a July summer camp, go to our website. We have an entire tab outlining our current strategies for summer camps. That said, we're in a dynamic time and things may change over the next month or so. Um, let's see here. Somebody asked a question about loggerheads being endangered. They may have missed that part of the discussion. So to answer, in Florida, our loggerheads are a threatened species, not an endangered species. They're part of the endangered species list, but they're at a slightly better status than an endangered status. And let's see here. How big are the hatchlings? Great question. Um, loggerhead and green hatchlings are about that big. So I'd say maybe a little bit smaller than a credit card. Leatherback hatchlings are a little bit bigger, maybe four and a half inches from nose to tail. All right, here's another mating question. When do turtles mate? They actually mate, um, generally we see the mating right before the start of nesting season, and then they'll continue mating throughout the season. Leatherback sea turtles and loggerhead sea turtles tend to nest a little bit further offshore, so it's not unusual for me to receive emails from concerned boaters and anglers with videos of sea turtles struggling at the surface of the water, wondering, are they healthy? Is everything okay? Usually that's uh, somebody who is fortunate enough to witness mating as it happens. Green sea turtles start nesting in midsummer, so, so June, early July. And the funny thing about green sea turtles is they nest in really shallow water. They nest right on shore, so it's not too unusual for green sea turtles to be seen by beachgoers uh, mating, I think I said nesting, mating right in the surf and in the waves. And again, we get phone calls about, you know, concerned concern citizens calling us about um, turtles that are rolling around in the surf. Usually if you see two turtles hanging out together like that, that's a sign that they're mating. All right, folks, I think we are just about out of time for our Q&A session. If you have any additional questions that I did not get to, please shoot me an email. Uh, we're gonna send you a follow-up email uh, later today or early tomorrow. It'll have my email address in it. I'd be happy to, to reply privately by email for any questions that I wasn't able to get to today. And with that, I just want to thank you again for spending a chunk of your afternoon with me. And uh, more importantly, thank you again for your continued support of Florida Oceanographic Society. And last but not least, I've repeated this a few times in my other lectures, your individual actions can have an impact on the environment. Just something as simple as following our clean, flat, and dark philosophy or refusing to use single-use plastic grocery bags once COVID-19 is a thing of the past. These are all things that you can personally do that will help protect our turtles. All right, folks, thank you again. I hope you had a nice time. And even if you are already a sea turtle expert, I hope you learned a little new fact or two during our talk today. Take care, everyone. Thank you again.